Like Zach. Pretty good there, pretty good, right? Good week, good week. Everybody doing good? Got some new faces here, that's exciting. Got some old faces here, that's exciting. So we got some missing faces here, so y'all need to call. Figure out where the missing faces are. So glad y'all here. Uh last week we got into the, the good stuff. It was like we said, it was time to define, and we define the four four things to make a better man. And the first one is courageously follows God's word. Number two. Yeah. <laughs> Love and protect God's woman. Three. It says that God's word. Harold, know, Harold knows that one. He loves that. He loves that lesson. We might let him teach that. One. So number four, better the world. Right. Good deal. Good deal. So we're gonna kind of start in session six. We got a special guest. I'm excited. Mr. Keith Boggs, founder of Real Momentum. He is. He's been a brother to me, and man, I just he's been a blessing. Uh, been through a lot. We've seen a lot. Seen a lot. Seen the Holy Spirit move and. 40 plus days uh he's lost a lot of weight he's been running around the the, the southeast for the last 40 days we're gonna give him a break and he's gonna take a week off and go deer hunting next week so we'll let him off so so uh, excited to be here tonight uh pray about jmo he's up trying to be a better man up with his bride up in north georgia doing what pastors do with their wives and men do with their wives when they're alone so so he's trying to be a better man so we pray for him as he's gone so uh, let me pray for keith and we'll get into session six. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. I thank you for Keith Boggs and his ministry and what he means to me. Father, uh, I ask that you anoint him right now with, with your word, that he brings the good life, Father, as we talk about the good life and uh, a man and what a good life is. Good life is not things. The good life is, is you and, and, and following you and uh, surrounding ourselves with men father and and close friends that we can rely on and iron sharpens iron as we continue to try to move through this and the men's ministry here at first baptist i ask that you continue to guide and bless and protect it father as we move forward um and uh, we just give this all time to you holy spirit we ask that you move in each and every one of our lives in jesus name we pray amen, amen. One, more thing. one more thing january 21st y'all remember what that is Steak night. Men's steak night. Keith Boz, real momentum will be here. If he wants to talk about it, he can. Okay. All right. Hey, <laughs> thank you, man of God. Thank you. Hey, guys, <clears throat> hope you're doing well. If you have your uh, Better Man book, hopefully you do. More than I hope you have the Word of God. So if you will, turn in page 35 on uh, tonight's session six. I'm excited about being here and just connecting with what's already been uh, taking place with uh, your pastor leading and it's been neat to see how churches have kind of bought into the better man process. And uh, what I want to say, I, I'm sure it's probably been said, um, this is not discipleship. This is just the on-ramp to discipleship. It really begins to set the, uh, the privilege before you as you hear biblical manhood teaching and then get around roundtables. The whole idea would be to interact with men, to really engage the Word of God, engage one another, and then hopefully out of that ex experience, at the end of Better Man, you step into a deeper relationship with other men uh, to journey with. And it may look different for some of you. Some of you may, may connect with a man at the table and, and run the rest of your life with him. It may just be for a season or it may just be, you know, through a period of your life. Uh, and then it, then it moves to somebody else. But uh, I think without this process, most guys would still be floundering around, trying to find out what life looks like, trying to make good decisions to honor God. But I praise God that this this teaching that was put together by Robert Lewis is really the own ramp to help us get focused as men in a day that needs clarity and conviction about what manhood is all about. So as you look at this lesson, you've been through five of them already. I've taught this live once. I've done Zoom calls with this uh, material. Um, I'm teaching it live right now in Knoxville, Tennessee. So it's amazing how engaging the content is with every man I've been able to see and, and, and walk through this. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you tonight with your pastor and your staff and their leadership, you have a gift. This is a gift. And not only is it a gift, it should be a tool that you use for the rest of your life. There is no reason that the men in your life, whether they're your son, future son-in-law, 
nephews, whoever they are, somebody you work with, they should have access to this material. You know why? Because you've had access to it. And you should be a good steward of the truth that you've heard. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things you've heard and seen of me among many witnesses, commit them to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So hopefully in Jesus' name, you're taking this truth, you're learning this truth, you're living this truth, and you're giving it away. And that's, that ought to be the case with every message you hear as a man of God, with every Sunday school class you go to. You're taking truth, living truth, and giving it away. That's the call on a man's life. When a man gets that, guess what? Other people have a chance to get it too. But if he doesn't get it and buy into the process, he'll never be the man God wants him to be which limits the ability of other people responding to the authority God gave you and God gave me. And let's not quench the Spirit and His activity and what He wants to do. And I'm so thankful that next week, after the election, God's still on the throne. Amen? No matter what happens, He's still going to be on the throne. So what do we do as men? We still walk with God. We still pray. We still seek His face. They can vote and determine the election however they want to vote. Because guess what? I'm just passing through. I'm going to another place. My home's not here. I live differently. You know why? I've been bought with a price. And because of that, that's what the good life is all about. America does not define the good life. Jesus Christ does. And it changes everything for all of us. No political party, no stance in any community makes that clarity. God does. And He does it through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So what I want to talk to you tonight is this this privilege of good life, there's notes that you have there before you, and I pray as we go through this, I'm going to add my own teaching privilege uh, and content as we go through this, but at the same time, as Pastor J. Mo has, he's probably shared stories with you and, and uh, life experience with you, and I'll do the same thing. So uh, it's good to take this content and make it your own, uh, but at the same time to take the biblical principles out of this and give it to other men, which you can do as well, okay? So... If you notice in the first part of the, uh, of the section on page 35, three approaches of manhood, and then out to the right of that, it talks about a real man. Last week you defined what the definition of manhood is coming out of the scriptures. Um, I've been discipling a young man, and uh, he, he just said there's more, there's more than one way to life. And I, I said, I, I'd have to disagree with you about that. I'm 47, I've, I've tried a couple of those ways, and I've only found out the best way to live is, is unto Christ. He's the only way to live. And so the sooner you figure that out, I don't care if you're 12 or if you're 22 or if you're 32, the sooner you figure that out, the better chance you have to be a godly man and to live it out uh, for everyone else to connect with as God desires. So these, these things about a real man, as we think about the true north, in terms of a man's life, number one, he courageously follows God and His Word. You've already gone through this with Chad. So if, if I tell you anything, everything begins with God and His Word. Okay? Everything. Everything begins with God and His Word. So as we understand that as men, and, and really surrender and buy into the, that we've been created by God, we've been created for God, until we buy into that and surrender that, we'll never be the man God wants us to be. I didn't say husband, I didn't say father, because all of that comes out of your manhood. How you lead your wife comes out of the core of who you are as a man. How you lead your children comes out of the core of who you are as a man. It's a call on your life to stand before God, to be created as a man, and then stand before God at the end of your life to give an account as a man. You won't stand before your wife, you won't stand before your family, you won't stand before your church, you'll stand before a holy God who created you with intention and specificity and what He wants you to be as as a man. So we got to know what that is. What does he do? He courageously follows God in his word. Number two, he loves and protects God's woman. He clearly loves and protects God's woman. One thing about the teaching that I, I like to add into that part, part is this. It's not only loving my wife and leading my wife, loving and leading my daughters, shepherding and tending to and taking care of the women God's placed in my wife. I have a, a mother-in-law uh, that I, I, I deeply love. She's my my uh, wife's mother, and then I also have a stepmom that my dad has been married to for over 20 years, and he, I'm watching him love and uh, serve his wife, and that, that ministers to me. But guess what? There's somebody missing, I think, in this teaching, and it's called the local church. 
A real man loves and protects God's woman. And guess what? It means the bride of Christ as well. So we need to add that piece into the puzzle that we sometimes miss. If we're not taking care of the bride, loving the bride, leading the bride, guess what? The city will feel it. Other people will feel it. And it will be a major detriment not only to our experience as believers, but also the city in which God's called us to reach. So a big part of manhood has to do with the man in his church and how he loves and protects God's woman, which is the bride. He's coming back for her one day as he sends his son to come and get her. And guess what? We're in the last days. It could happen tonight. That's why we've got to make sure that we're in shape so we help the church be what God wants it to be. Thirdly, a real man excels at God's work. He excels at God's work. Whatever you do, the Bible teaches, do it hardly as unto the Lord and not unto men. The greatest thing that a man deals with, especially in these areas of his life, is the fear of man. It gets in the way of who God wants him to be. It steps in front of his faith. It handicaps his, his ability to be what God would call him to be because he's so afraid and concerned what other people may think. The greatest detriment, I believe, during this COVID situation is we've seen the passivity and the paralyzing of the church in that it's not being able to overcome what we're up against as the bride of Christ marching on for the glory of God. And I just think this has exposed us. And we haven't been able to press in. What I have seen has, has really alarmed me. We're not live, leading and living with an anointed conviction in how we do things. We're letting everybody else dictate what we do because we're scared what they might say and how we respond with something called a pandemic. Now guess what? It can come and it can leave. It can get worse as we go on. The question is, what will I do with this great opportunity of COVID-19? Will I be better because of it? Will I press into the opportunity and recognize God wants me to, what He wants me to be, which connects me to the last point. A, a real man betters God's world. I don't care the climate. I don't care the circumstance. I don't care what we're going through. I believe in Jesus' name that we as God's men can better God's world. Everything ought to change because why? God lives inside of me. God lives through me. He changes the world because of what He's doing in me because He's so concerned about those around me. He, he desires to move through me. That's why He lives in me. He's not moving in to stay. He wants to get out and change the world around me. So with that in mind, as you think about that clear definition of manhood, it's the vision that I pray not only your church calls men back to throughout the seasons of their life, throughout the challenges in the culture, throughout the challenges maybe in the church. We're calling men back to courageously follow God's word. We're calling men back to what? Love and protect God's woman. We're calling men back to to do what? To, to excel at God's work, to make a difference at work, to lead with integrity, to recognize that's the place of worship, not just a place I check in to get a, to get a paycheck. That's what I do. It's who I am. God created me to work. And then I better God's world as I go through this, but the challenges that we come up against is number one, there is the self-made man. You're going to want to make your own reality. You want to be that man. You want to, you want to make yourself. And there's difficulty with this. Selfishness does create a lot of problems. But the self-made man, you, you believe you have or should have what it takes to be a man, yet you're deceived. You, ha you don't have what it takes. There's nothing of you that could help you be the man God wants you to be apart from Jesus Christ. You don't bring, listen to me, anything to the table. Did you hear me? You don't bring anything to the table. He's got it all. So you need to press into Him to find out what that is. He's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Apart from me, He says, you can't do anything. So we need Christ to be the man God wants us to be. And the self-made man is deceived to think he can be that man. He thinks he has the willpower to do that, yet he neglects God's power for that, and it causes problems everywhere he goes. In reality, manhood comes from within. is how the self-made man thinks. I can muster this up. I can create this. I can make this happen. And yet you find yourself in deep, deep trouble. Matter of fact, the Bible says there is a way that seems right into a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. You're in trouble as you begin to think that I've got this figured out. In Jesus' name, may we seek the face of God and find out what He says about what we ought to be as men. Number two, the image conscious man. This is a predominating reality in our day. And so... Your manhood copies culture and the changing times. So fads dictate what you do rather than your faith. Uh, I've watched the church in, in, in the years I've been a part of it, especially on staff in churches as a pastor or uh, as a staff member and even now as a ministry leader in a different way. Uh, I've watched how churches just 
change with the times. And I'm, I think I'm okay with that if, if we say core to Scripture. But I've seen how music's changed, styles have changed. I mean, used to you couldn't wear a hat in church. And, you know, all these things have changed. It's been amazing how things have changed. So fads determine how we reach people rather than faith. And you can't reach a lost man if you keep changing the fad. Because that's always going to be a reality of change. And I just want you to pay attention to what we're living in and how that, that plays out because your manhood is copying a culture and changing times and you will find yourself most wanting. And manhood comes from without. So we're looking at everything else outside of our manhood to determine what it looks like. And guess what? They'll get it wrong every single time. And on the other one, the self-made man, we're looking at everything from the inside and we're trying to live it out. And, and guess what? We'll get it wrong every time. We need somebody else on the outside, the Creator God, to help us see what it looks like. And He did that by sending Jesus Christ in the form of a man to live on this earth. And thank God He did. He gave us the clarity of what that looks like, which is letter C. The transcendent man, which is mean beyond the ordinary. There never was a man like Christ when Christ stood upon the planet. Amen. Never was, and there never will be. So he showed us with clarity what it meant to live before a holy God. How could we lead? How could we love? How, we, how could we be the answer in a day and time that we're living in? He showed us how to do that, and it's called the life-giving manhood of Jesus Christ. So God created man, and God called man to embrace a timeless manhood responsibility we'll find in Genesis that you went through last week, and you'll unpack the rest of the time that you have. And this manhood comes from the Word of God, okay? It comes from God's Word. We've already defined that. And I just want to move through the time to help you recognize manhood in the good life and really move through this lesson to help us connect in the area that we need to, okay? So here's the question. Can the good life be defined? Research and social science says yes. Research... And social science says yes. So here's, as we go through this, I just want to take you through it. Social science, like Harvard's 75-year study of an adult development, has helped to document and define what the good life is. There's such a thing as that out there. And you'd think this, that Harvard would learn some things, but they just keep learning some stuff and never apply the application of what we're discovering. Uh, at the same time, um, I think as we look at this, we're, we're moving through that we can get we can get um, some things as we, we see what Dr. Uh, Robert Waldinger said. People are closely connected to family and friends. They're happier and physically, physically healthier and live longer lives than people less socially connected. So that's a big deal as we look at life and how that works out and we navigate this and we move through this. And uh, other research studies summarized by ABC News Special, The Mystery of Happiness, Who Was It and How to Get It or Who Has It and How to Get It, also confirm the good life. So what does research tell us about the good life? It tells us that it's not wealth and possessions. The good life is not wealth and possessions, okay? Everybody said amen. It's not wealth and possessions. Because you can keep getting and never be satisfied. And everybody ought to say amen to this. It's not good looks. <laughs> amen. It's not good looks. Okay, look to your brother and say, hey, buddy, it is certainly not good looks, okay? Look to your right, look to your left. It is not good looks, okay? Thank God for that, amen, because there's hope for you, right? So much is spent on looks. Listen to me. I'm, I'm leaving First Baptist Woodstock, and I get a call from a woman. I don't even know. I, I pick the number up. I, I get calls all the time from numbers I don't recognize because of what I do. And I get this call in, and this lady says, hey, I, my name's Mallory. And I said, hey, Mallory, I got a daughter named Mallory. Uh, she said, I, I know you don't know who I am, and you weren't expecting a phone call from me, but we have a, have a, a friend, and she named his name. <laughs> and I said, yes, I know him really well. And I'm thinking, ma'am, this guy's got my name on his resume or something. He's a former pastor. He wants, he wants me to give a good word for him. And so I'm, I'm just listening to the lady. I thought she's maybe on a search committee or something like that. So she begins to tell me why she's calling. I, I, just, I actually had to stop the car I was in so I could process what she was saying. And she's calling to say, hey, I'm a fashion designer. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time and bring you over some samples of clothing if you'd be interested. I said, ma'am, could you say that again? <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, you're calling me to help me look better? And I said, I got a daughter, I got seven daughters and a wife that helped me every single day. I don't need another woman to tell me what to wear, amen? <laughs> but I thought, what, what, what are we doing? We're spending money on somebody to tell us how to dress, 
how to act, what matches and what doesn't matches, and we think that helps us be the image of what a man ought to be. Guess what? You're mistaken. You're mistaken. And so many guys are concerned about the outside. And God's really concerned about what's going on in here, that you really know Him and connect with Him and live it out. So the, the bottom line is not good looks, and thank God for that. Number, number, number next is it's not thrilling experiences. If you got bu- a bucket list, lift your hand up. You might got bucket lists. I got, I got some bucket list items. I've been able to do some things, and I've checked some stuff off, but I still got an Alaska trip on my mind. I've got some other things on my mind, so I'm praying through, God, can you make this happen? Uh, some other things I've got out there that I just got before the Lord, and they're bucket lists, and they're items I'm praying about I'd like to experience one day. But guess what? If I don't experience that or not, that does not measure my accomplishment in life. Uh, the next one is this, personal achievements and fame. Personal achievements and fame. And guess what? That's not always going to be uh, the measure of a man. The measure of a man is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. If you got time to go and look at that, I would take time to, to pray through that even before your next lesson. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 lays out 20 characteristics of a man's life. What is it that he's measured by? What is it that not only God's looking for, but other people are looking for? What is it that the church needs? How is it that a man raises his children, especially sons? 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. It was such an instrumental, instrumental passage in the life of Gene Getz. He wrote a book called The Measure of a Man, which really turned out to be his church planning strategy. And his reasoning was this. If we can build men, we can plant churches. If we can't build men, we can't plant churches. You can't plant churches off marketing. You only plant churches off of men. And God does that through 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. So as we move through this and understand some things and recognize these realities, over 80% of millennials say a major life goal is to get rich. To get rich. And that's what's being communicated from the culture we live in today. Ask how great it was to win the Super Bowl, and Tom Brady replied, Is this it? There's got to be more to life than this, and he's really finding that out even right now with the team he plays for. And so is Cam Newton, right? (laughs) It's amazing what happens. It's crazy. See what the research says the good life is. This is research, okay? We're not looking at Scripture yet. We're looking at social sciences and the dictation of what we're learning from the culture and what they're saying, what science or research says in terms of what Uh, pattern of behaviors are trying to communicate to us and some of these things may land close to scripture which number one is close friends i think that is a reality we need to know about okay close friends one of the things i love to teach about in better man is this who are going to be the men that will walk you out to the grave what are their names does your wife know who they are Do your children and your children's children know who they are? Do they have good relationships with the men that will carry you to your last day, so to speak, upon earth before they lay you in the ground? Do you have close friends? Research says that 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 helps a man in terms of a good life. And then the other one is this. um, A good marriage. A good marriage. And I agree with this. But there'll be more to come with this one in the next few weeks. Some would say a happy wife is a happy life. And all the married men said amen, right? The other one is control over life. Control over life. You can't control everything, of course, but you can be wise and take steps that will reduce unnecessary stress and turmoil and add greater stability and satisfaction in your life. If you're a young man, I want you to pay close attention to me, okay? What you're learning in this series of Better Man is a gift. If you capture what God's saying to you in terms of mission as it relates to manhood, in terms of vision as it relates to value in your life, guess what? You will be way ahead in your generation. But if you dangle and dabble with this, you will not be the man God wants you to be, and you'll miss out on an awesome opportunity. So if you're a young man, I'm I'm telling you, in Jesus' name, you have some gold here. I would hang on to this. I would mind this at my table. I would do whatever I can to make sure I'm being engaged by older men, by senior men. I'm being equipped by men who care about me. I'm being 
edified and challenged to grow and mature and encouraged to be the man God wants me to be. Take advantage of this. And by the way, let the little boy stay seated so the big man, the man himself, can stand up inside of you. May he no longer get up as a little boy. May he stand as a man. And men in the room here, we have every responsibility to help them get up out of the seat. May they not stay in the seat after going through better man. May they have a vision and recognize the value as to why God made them. And the sooner they get there, the better. I was reading about young men recently. I've, I've even got a book called Thoughts uh, to Young Men written by J.C. Ryle in 1986. God's used it to give me a vision for the next generation. How do we reach the next generation? How do we give them footprints? Why did he write a book in 1886 and we still haven't got it? How did that happen? How did it miss us? It's amazing. Albert Moeller said it's one of the most in intentional books ever written to our generation, yet we're not applying what it says. It's overwhelming what it says. I'll read some thoughts out of the book at the end of this because it's so practical and so in our face. So you can't control everything, but you can be wise and take steps that will reduce unnecessary stress and unnecessary turmoil and add greater stability and satisfaction to your life. In other words, you can stand as a man of God at 12, at 13, at 14, at 15 today. Don't wait until you become of age, whatever that is. By the way, they're pushing it on out into the late 20s and in the late 30s that they give you permission to be an adult. Culture wants to milk you in your childishness all they can so they can shape your life all they can. That sounds like Satan to me. So four, four practical things you can do to make, more, make life more manageable for you, okay? These are applicable things that all of us can apply. Listen to me, today, <laughs> today. Number one, stay out of harmful debt. This is true. I think this is great, great insight, okay? Stay out of harmful debt. Guess what? It won't look like the world if you do it God's way. Amen? I've been talking to my whole family. I've got ten of them. Ten, ten children, seven daughters, and three boys. I, I just simply say, you're probably not going to get a car from mom and daddy. You're probably not going to get an education from mom and daddy. You're probably not going to get this, that, and the other from mom and daddy. But guess what? You can get it from Christ. If you seek Him first, He will give you what He wants you to have. If it's college, He's got it paid for already. He's already marked out a plan. The question is, will you wait on Him to do that? It could take you four, five, six, seven years to get a degree. Listen to me. I would rather fate take, listen, out of experience, I'd rather take five, six, seven years to get my degree where it's completely paid for rather than borrow the money and come out in debt and carry that into my marriage relationship and have it around my neck until I pay it off. Okay? That's just insight from my own experience. You don't have to borrow the money. Trust me. I'm watching my daughter do it right now. It's amazing what God does when we get things right. Stay out of harm for debt. Number two, pay attention to your health. Pay attention to your health. My wife is doing everything she can to help me stay healthy as long as I can. When you add the number of kids that we have, the youngest is two, the oldest is 21, there's a great chance that the one that's 21 is going to have one that's going to be close to, closer to two than the one that's behind her. Amen. There's a greater chance than that. So I want to be around to help pour into my children's children. Listen to me, if I'm not around, there ought to be enough truth that I've lived during the time I've been around that they can take it and give it to him as well. They shouldn't guess on where daddy stands or where dad, granddaddy was. They should know where, where Christ is in my life and my heart. So I want to pay attention to my health. I want to make sure I'm physically healthy, I'm spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy. I want to be a healthy man of God in every area of my life. My wife needs my mind to be sharp, so do my children. My wife needs my physical ability to be sharp so I'm healthy and can give good energy in areas of need. And then at the same time, they want to make sure that I'm spiritually healthy so I can lead them as God would have me lead them in whatever part of life that they need uh, counsel and navigation. And number three, avoid long-term disputes. This is healthy. If you have aught with your brother, the Bible teaches you can't even worship. Matthew chapter 5. If there's conflict between you and you have aught with your brother or sister and you remember the Bible says, therefore go and reconcile to your brother. You can't even bring your gift to the altar and, 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 and worship. So you're already at odds, not with the one that you have an offense with, you're already at odds with God. You can't connect with Him because of the offense that is horizontal. I can't even get vertical with Almighty God because why? Of an offense. 
So in Jesus' name, if you're held back because of some problem that hasn't been resolved, be the man of God and go and offer forgiveness. Go and offer things and, and, and try to make it right. It will open the door for so much more that God has for you. But until you do, the Bible said you can't even offer your gift in worship. So quit playing games with the God and go reconcile and stop the long-term dispute. Number four, seek help to break any harmful addictive habits. <clears throat> and just to help communicate some of this, when you're born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your decisions. How am I thinking? What am I doing in terms of what I'm deciding and how I'm living out life? And then lastly is a vibrant faith, okay? A vibrant faith. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, or excuse me, chapter 1 and verse number 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. How do we engage the faith side of the good life? How does this happen? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, listen to the language, according to His great mercy... God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. One of my daughter's words is hope for the year. She, she's longing to experience hope. So according to God's great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Could you imagine what it was like to hear about the resurrection and then to not only hear about the resurrection, but to be there and experience the resurrected Christ when He interacted with you on the other side of the resurrection? That was a big deal. If anybody needed hope, it was the people that thought, man, He's dead and He's gone. No, He's alive and He's real. Amen? He's right here. Resurrection hope. He's right before our eyes. We beheld Him, and we held Him, the Scripture says, according to what He was doing for us. We were walking with Him in reality. So that's an awesome experience. Verse 4. Why did this happen? To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And then here's another passage for you, okay? First, first chapter in the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. But as many as received Him to them, He gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is clear from God's Word in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. So number one... Letter A, faith begins with God's great mercy. Thank God for God's great mercy. And every man ought to say amen. Thank God for the mercy that He provides for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. To God be the glory. When I recognize my sinfulness, when I reckon my desire to obey God, but I don't obey God, when I have a desire to, to be pleasing to God, you got to choose the other way to live. I, I don't de depend upon the Spirit of God. I operate in the flesh, and I, I, it profits nothing. Thank God for the mercy of Almighty God. Amen? So praise God for His mercy. Now, I've heard the statement said before, it's worth throwing this teaching in here, that sometimes people will say there's grace for that. There's grace to disobey. There's grace not to go to church. There's grace to just kind of go sow your wild oats. There's grace to, to drink. There's grace to do this because you can always ask for forgiveness. Do not presume upon grace. Did you hear me? Do not presume upon grace. You need the mercy of God, dear friend. What grace does, God gives me grace that is desire and power to want what He wants, to live out what His the plan is, to live out in obedience. God gives me grace to be obedient. God gives me grace to what? Follow His Word, to love my wife, to, to better God's world and excel in God's Word. God gives me grace for that. I can't do that without God's grace. So the mercy sets the stage for God's greatest grace to take place in our lives. It's not so much mercy that we need, obviously. It's the grace that comes after that that God provides for us to live the life He's called us to live. Because guess what? Apart from me, you can't do nothing. Whenever you're weak, Christ says we're strong. Man, you're, you're a great candidate for the power of God if you're weak. Praise God. And all that has to do with how God moves through grace, beginning with mercy. You see, God always makes the first move. 
God always makes the first move. I love this statement in the book. It may be through a stranger, an event or crisis, a friend, a family member, or an unusual circumstance. Whatever the means, God steps into our lives with a whisper or shout and says, I have a better way for you. When that dear brother invited you to better man, that was God's invitation for you. That didn't just happen. Because why? God's working in him, both to will and to do through him what brings God great pleasure. So the reason why you got that invitation was because, first of all, it came from Almighty God. He made the first move. Could you imagine that guy asking you to begin with? It had to be an act of God, right? So God moves through that man to get a hold of you, and he offers a plan that begins with great, great mercy. And so number two, letter B, faith comes alive when we respond to God, when we believe and are born again. That's how faith comes alive. Now take your Bible, I want to read this to you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1, it's not going to be in your book. Uh, I like to just go to Scripture when I want to make a point, so here's the, the point I want to make. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. If you're with me, say amen. Some of you fell asleep. Can you wake the guy up to you? Just wake him up. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says this. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So what did he tell us there in Ephesians chapter 2? He told us what the first part of the lesson was about. Hey, listen, you, you're going to have a self, self-made self man. You're going to have this selfish man. You're going to have this, this culture man that looks like the culture and be influenced by everybody else. And then you're going to have this transcendent man that shows up at the end of this passage I'm going to be reading to you. All this is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number, number 1 through 10. So we've seen the guy who's selfish. We've seen the guy who's being influenced by culture and taking things on the outside to make his man come alive. The guy on the inside making this man had come alive. Those don't profit a man. So he unpacks it. But God, who is rich in mercy. Amen. How does this change? God moves in. Amen. God steps in. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in which his kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. He goes on to say in verse number 9, Not of works as anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. In them, and to God be the glory. And then going back up to first chapter in first John, or the first chapter of the Gospel of John, verses twelve and thirteen, He's given us this this right to become the children of God to those who believe in His name. We were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but we were born of Almighty God. And that is a game changer for any man who's claimed to be to be a Christian. He's born of God, and guess what? God ought to be able to tell, and so should every other man he comes in contact with. If we're having to guess if you're born again, you're already in trouble with Almighty God. Did you hear me? If I'm having to guess if you're born again, if you've been bought by the blood of God, by the blood of Christ, if I'm having to guess at that, if your wife's having to guess, if your children have to guess, at your funeral they don't even know if you're saved or lost, guess what? You're already in trouble with Almighty God. To be born again, something has to die. This is basic Christianity 101. Question, you want to live? You want to experience new life? You've got to die first. Listen to me, you die to everything. You die to the way you think. You die to the way you've been doing life. You die to the system you've been 
doing life under and trying to keep up with. You die to trying harder and trying more. You die to everything. You die to all the stuff you did that you know was and is wrong. All of it dies. Every bit of it dies. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Guess what? If you don't die now, you'll die some other time. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You may die, listen to me, tonight, separated from God forever. Do not play games with this glorious salvation. It's a beautiful salvation. And God wants you to know if you're saved and have the chance to experience the good life. You're born again to a new life, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. It all starts over. Why? He rose again. And so can you. Thank God He teaches us what this looks like. So, let her see. Faith joins us to a living hope. Faith joins us to a living hope. <clears throat> Jesus' resurrection changed everything. Amen? It changed everything. I am the resurrection and the life. Part of my story is I... I came to the cross, but I didn't, I didn't really experience resurrection power until I reconciled with God fully and completely as Lord God Almighty. And that changed everything. So I could say there's so much more on the other side of the cross. It's one thing to come to the cross. It's another thing to live on the other side of the cross in resurrection power. It changes everything. That resurrection power is there for all of us who's been born again. The question is, am I walking in that life? Am I experiencing that kind of victory? Jesus' resurrection changed everything. There is no greater moment in life than the one where you experience Jesus alive in your life. No greater moment. So here's the reality. Baseball just finished, right? <laughs> Did y'all watch much of it? It's a little different, wasn't it? Amen, a little different. I had a hard time watching the Braves play in the playoffs in a, in a foreign land. <laughs> They're supposed to be in, in Atlanta because... I, could, I got thinking, if they win the World Series and we, they're not here, man, we, well, that, that's our only chance, right? It's been 20 years since they won. Well, when you think about baseball, you have to think about the movie The Natural. Anybody ever seen The Natural? So that's not a real reality. But what happened in 19, 1988 when the Dodgers were in the World Series again? So it's been a long time since they won the World Series, but it was back in 1988. And so in 1988, there was this man by the name of Dennis Eckersley who was one of the, arguably the best closer in the, in the game of baseball. And I know during that time, he was probably the best closer in the game of baseball. Well, there's this guy that they call off the bench at the bottom of the ninth whose name that we all know, Kirk Gibson, he can't even walk up the steps to get out of the dugout, much less get to the on-deck circle, much less take a step in the batter's box to have a chance to pinch hit in this World Series game, bottom of the ninth, everything on the line. And what does he do? Just like in that movie when you see and the natural hit that home run and, and the ball goes up into the lights and knocks the lights out and all the dramatic uh, display that takes place in the movie. Well, man, this happened in real life when Kirk Gibson hit that ball over the wall for the, for the Dodgers to win the World Series that year. And so when you think about what, what God can do in terms of a living hope and how that changes, man, we ought to get the same lights to go out and the same joy that whenever we connect with God, everything changes. Not at the swing of the bat when the ball hits the bat, at the crack of a bat. Yes, the game can change, but listen to me. Our lives can change when we give our life to Christ. It should change, amen? If any man is Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things are passed away and, and all things are becoming new. What a gift we have. So what Jesus did was not something in a script. Not just in a Bible. It was reality. It's not some fairy tale or some story. It's the facts of life. Eyewitnesses saw Him after the resurrection. They laid eyes on Him on the cross. They saw Him on the other side of the cross. And so it's not some fairy tale. It is a reality. And if we reconcile with that, it will change our life. And it ought to do it every single day. So, letter D, faith assures us of our inheritance in heaven. Faith assures us of, an, of our inheritance in heaven. So, we have lived beyond this life. Or, excuse me, we have life beyond this life. Question mark. Are you living like it? 
Are you living like there's life beyond this life? What helps you make decisions, earth or eternity? My pastor, Johnny Hunt, used to be my pastor. He would say it this way, live life in light of eternity. How are you making decisions? He approaches giving where he says it this way, helping men understand the biblical principle and privilege of giving. Give while your hands are still warm. And give with an open hand so God can put more in there so we can give more out of there. It's amazing the principles God's taught me from my pastor. It's awesome what God does when you hear biblical truth. Give while you still can. See the benefits of it that motivates you to give more and influence more. Hey, sad is the day when men and even churches look at needs and say, because we can't meet it in this person's life, we shouldn't meet it in this person's life. That is not the gospel. Hey, it never does add up in God's economy. And if you don't start it now, you may never see it tomorrow. So may God help you recognize what that looks like. Jesus says it in John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. He will live even if he dies. So as you think about reserved, and it really means you, you, you can count on it. It's, it's guaranteed. It, it, you can expect it. There's a, there's a life coming to us. And so as we finish, and you probably heard this verse, you even heard of John 3.16? You could probably quote it, couldn't you? In the New King James translation, there are 12 words that run up to the word son, and then are 12 words that run after the word son. So 12 words are doing all it can to run to Jesus, and 12 words are doing all it can to run from Jesus. So what's the scripture say? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Word 13. The next 12 words say this, That whosoever believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there's 12 that run to Jesus and 12 that run from Jesus. He is the one that changes everything. So as we look to Jesus and we live from Jesus, we all experience the brand new life. So here's the question. Are you connected to Jesus? Are you connected to Jesus? Faith in God is the beginning point of real manhood. Nothing happens without it. Do you hear me? Nothing happens without it. So everyone in here needs to answer this question, okay? Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to, to Him, or excuse me, to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, listen to it, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5. Examine yourselves. Put yourself to the test. Make proof of. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not know or realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Each week you've gathered, and we come together as men, not only here but other places. We're focused on one thing, and that's the heart of men. <laughs> that's my desire when I meet at Woodstock. That's what I try to communicate to other churches, man. Go after the heart of men. Just go after the heart of men. And praying that they're seeking to be right with God. Just pray that God helps them to be right with God. Which reminds me of an of a opportunity that we had as a ministry to go to 
a pastor's conference out further east of here, out near Augusta, we're in between Augusta on, on Lake Oconee. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was a, a great time as our ministry was invited to come be a part of that. And so my wife and I went. Some other friends of our went of ours went that, to help us with the, the the booth that we had there. And so we we were there for three days and get ready to leave. We packed everything up. All these pastors and their wives are, are going out the door and getting everything out of the rooms. They've, they've done the sessions. They've been with, with uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt. They've done some great time together as a staff or whatever. And so these, these people began to leave, and they, they get their cars driven up to the front. We were staying at um, the Ritz-Carlton over on, on Lake Oconee, and it's really just a great place, a great time. Uh, I couldn't afford it had I not been invited. So anyway, I showed up there, and uh, I'm benefiting from them going to get your car and bring your car to you. They didn't help us pack up our stuff, but they at least helped us bring it out uh, to, the, to the front there, the foyer there. So I, we're one of the last ones to get everything picked up and packed up and, and making our way out. So as I began to wake, make my way out the, the, two, the two sections of doors, there's a door and then another door, and then it opens up out to the, uh, out to the property where the cars come through. I, I walk out the first door, and there's this woman that I know, and, and I recognize her, and we would speak normally, but she, she had tears in her eyes that were coming down her face. She looked at me, then looked beyond me, coming inside. And as I make my way out the door, out into the, the foyer area where the cars are parked, there's, there's multitudes of pastors and wives and luggage out there and, and multitudes of cars out there. And it's, it's, it's like, what, what's happening? So my eyes get up off of those pastors out into the property, out in the center part of that, that circle, that paved circle where they have you know, landscape and grass out there. And I see this pastor I know, from America's Georgia, who's the pastor of Central Baptist Church, and he's, he's performing CPR on one of the attendants out there on the property out there. He's performing CPR. And I said, what in the world's going on? So we began to ask around us, and, and before we were able to get a lot of the answers, he gets off the man, and another person jumps on the man and keeps performing CPR. So he's pumping, he gets off, the other person pumps and pumps and pumps. That person gets tired, he gets off, and then a lady jumps on there, and it just rotates through. So four of them, two men and two ladies. Two of the ladies were a part of, of Brian's church. One of them was his wife, and the other one was the children's pastor's wife. And she happened to be a CPR nurse, or not a CPR nurse, but an ER nurse at the local hospital there. So she, she organized the CPR of the man to keep him alive while they called the paramedics to come and save this man's life. <clears throat> So it took forever. I'm, like, I'm thinking, golly, where is the ambulance at? Where's the fire truck at? And they're pumping, they're pumping, they're pumping. We're praying up there at the, at the front, and they're, they're pumping and praying, pumping and praying, pumping and praying. They'd pump, and then they'd get on their knees and pray. It was amazing. I could never forget this, this image. It's always going to be in my mind's eye. It's amazing what they were doing. They were doing everything they can to keep this man alive. Would to God the church in America would do the same thing. Amen? And she comes back over there. They, the the paramedics finally arrive, and this ER nurse comes back over there. I can overhear her talking to Pastor Brian, who's my friend. They'll have a conference in January. Johnny Hunt and Rick Burgess in America's Georgia. If you want to drive four hours and, and, and it'd be worth it, that's the conference, okay? Johnny Hunt and Rick Burgess on a Friday night in South Georgia ought to be good. So anyway, she comes over there, and I hear, I hear her say, and she makes this statement. She said, I had to keep pumping as hard as I could. I broke three ribs because I had to get to his heart. Wow. I had to get to his heart. Because if I can get to his heart, I can keep him alive. The only way a man lives is for God to get to his heart. And if you're here tonight, God's never got a hold of your heart. You may have prayed a prayer you may be playing games at the foot of the cross, but you've never been converted by this God who changes the world. You need Jesus. He's come to get your heart tonight. And if you're lost without God, if you're uncertain about eternity, I would do everything I could tonight to reconcile with a holy God. A pandemic is not the problem. Man's heart is the problem. And whatever we got to do to reconcile with God, maybe it's the pandemic God's going to use to get our attention. And whatever it takes, I say, God, send it, because we obviously don't have your attention. In Jesus' name, get our hearts back. Grab our hearts. May God do it 
in his own time. So the question is this, are you connected to Jesus? Faith in God is the beginning point of real manhood. Nothing happens without it. Have you ever, I'll ask again, have you ever surrendered your heart and life to Jesus? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? If not, what's holding you back? Let's close in prayer. Every head bow and every eye closed. Maybe you're here tonight, you just say, you know what? I need Christ. I want God to get my heart. I need to know that I know. Would you pray with me? Simply just say this, Dear God, I want to talk with you openly and honestly about my life right now. I want to tell you that I've, I've tried living my life my way. And I'm sorry. I need and want your forgiveness. I want my old life to die with Christ. And I want a new life that starts now. You give the power, God. Only you, you give the power. I trust you. I believe you. I give you my heart right now. I want to declare that Jesus is my Savior. Help me, God. Help me build my life. Bless my life so I can bless others. I want to follow you for the rest of my life on earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Chad, if you want to come up and lead them to the next stage of the, of the, the table time. As you get to the table, guys, every single question in your book needs to be answered tonight at the table, okay? If you prayed that prayer, would you tell your table leader as soon as you get to the table, okay? Don't play games with eternity. Don't let Satan get the seed and do something with it. Don't let it fall on shallow ground or rocky soil. Don't let Satan run away with it. If you prayed that prayer, get rooted tonight in Christ. Give your life completely, your heart completely to God. And as Chris, I mean, uh, Chad prays in just a few minutes, I pray the table time will do what it's required to do. It will sharpen us. It will encourage us. It will help us understand what Scripture says and how to live it. And I'll just say this, I, I may not get to come back. I may be in heaven when, I come, when January rolls around. I don't know. If you're at a table, at a man's table, and you give your opinion, in Jesus' name, stop it. Okay? Give divine revelation. He can't live on some man's lie, but he can live on truth for the rest of his life. If you can't answer with biblical answers, don't answer. Don't give your opinion. And if you do give your opinion, at least preference to say, hey, this is my opinion. I don't know what the Scripture says about this. This is what I'm thinking about it. At least clarify that so we know where we stand. Where we stand. The best thing you can give a man is the Word of God. Give him all of life, every bit of it. And watch what he does as he comes alive as he responds to it. So thank you for the privilege to come here. May God use better man to change not only First Baptist Conyers, but the city of Conyers, East Atlanta, Georgia, and the world. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Keith. You, you're going to stand right here, brother. We're going to pray for you. Uh, listen, guys, I, as Keith, has, you heard his heart. If you don't get anything out, out of this, you've got to get this. You, you can't be a better man apart from Christ. You just can't. And, and I've tried. I've heard key stories. He's tried. It just it can't be done. I, I encourage you tonight, when you get to those tables, challenge your men around the tables. Young guys, I'm telling you, this is nothing to play with. It's, it's time. Birth pains are here. We all see it. Just Just... Take the time, be truthful, honest with your team, with your, your guys around you, and just just love on them, and let's, let's be honest and open and uh, make sure before you walk out of these doors of where you're going to end up, okay? Let me pray for Keith. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I just, I just, I love this man beside me. He's my brother. I just thank you for his ministry. I ask that you continue to bless him and his family and his ministry, Father. I know... 
Um, he needs clearance and guidance on some things. Father, I pray that you would uh, remove the blinders, Father, from him, that uh, you would guide him in the way, your ways, Father, not, not Keith's ways, not my ways, not, not anybody else's ways, but, but your ways, Father. I ask that you move in this time tonight at tables. Father, if there's men here or, or, uh, that, that, that need you, Father, just, I just ask that you just pierce their heart right now. Father, as they sit down at the table, they just share. And we just help, help a man. Father, if, if, if one man leaves here lost, we all lose. We all lose. We just want you to move in this time, in this table time together. We ask for, the, we ask for uh, your travel mercies on Keith. We ask that he gets, has a good time next week. Father, just work in his my heart and his mind, Father. We pray for January 21st, Father, that uh, you start preparing the hearts of men in here and outside this walls of this church, Father, that we start inviting men, that we just start zoning, we start, we start hunting, we start scoping out the men that we know need you, that we get him there that night and we can go further in their walk with them. We help them, Father, help them to point them to you, Father. That's what we want, Father. Thank you again for this time. Thank you for Keith Boggs, Father. Um, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.